In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Why do I begin my sermons that way anyway? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is it for your benefit or for mine? And the answer is both. Because when I stand up here, I'm reminding myself I'm speaking on behalf of God. I'm speaking his word from his office, telling you of his mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness for sinners. So I'm telling myself that I had better hand over the goods. I had better give you the good stuff of God's grace for sinners. Which means also, unfortunately, I have bad news for you. You're sinners, and I have to explain that to you too. But when I stand up here, I need to, I have to, it's my obligation to tell you that though you are sinful indeed, God forgives you for the sake of Jesus Christ. I am compelled to give you 200 proof, full blast, unaltered gospel, untainted, undistorted good news. And sometimes I actually manage to hit the mark, and sometimes I kind of hit the mark. But when I go home on Sunday afternoon, and I go to take my nap, I can look in the mirror and ask myself, did I tell sinners about their Savior today? And if I can say yes, then I can slip into my coma-like slumber for two or three hours. So this all brings us to our epistle text for today, Ephesians 5. And as I mentioned, one of the most hated texts in premarital counseling, one of my most hated texts by feminists of the 20th and 21st and a half century, It is awful, and so I'm glad to tell you all about it. Wives, stop there. Ladies, did I mention that this text is really hated? Completely misunderstood, seldom explained, so let's open our minds, because sometimes it's hard to get past the second word of this text. It's tough, so let's just open our minds for a moment, set aside our prejudice. Here we go. Ready? Wives, submit, stop. How can I do that? He's a monster, Pastor. He doesn't put the toilet seat down. How can I submit to someone like this? Do you understand these things, Pastor? Let's let's work on this. I'm kidding, kind of, but I'm, I'm kind of kidding. Let's focus. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, breathe in and out. We're going to talk about this for a moment. English is a terrible language, but we all speak it. The Greek here gives us a little bit of a better understanding here. The Greek word, you maybe have even heard this preached on as hypotasso or hupotasso, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It is translated into English as subject, but it's really kind of weak. Think of this in the same way that Jesus is fully God, and yet he submits to the Father. He's no less God than the Father, and yet he says that I have come to do my Father's will. He's not less than. He's not even other than. He's fully God. You ladies are of equal value, equal worth, and equal everything as your husbands. But God has called you to have a certain rule. So ladies, hold that thought for now. I'm done speaking with you. This is only about a quarter of the way through the sermon. The rest, now I get to beat on the men. So you can go to whatever you want to do now. Have a snack. Men! I'm getting all King James on you now. 1 Peter 1.13 Gird up your loins like a man. Be sober. And hope for the end, hope and grace to be brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. I always wanted to say that. It's like calling the Spartans to war. Gird up your loins for war. Let's go. Ephesians 5 for men. 
Wives were called to recognize that they are equal but different to place themselves under your authority, your command. What are you called to do? Are you girded? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Stop there. Die for your wife. Die to yourself. Die to your passions. Die to your lust. Christ did all of this for his bride. He loved her to death, even death on a cross. And what was in it for him? A really good beating. A death that is terrible. The worst death ever because the sins of the world were placed on him who was sinless. And why did he do it? That he might sanctify her, the text says, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any other thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Christ died for you all, men and women, so that your sin would be exchanged for his righteousness, so that he could give you all of his goodness. He does this with the washing of the water and the word, our text says. Baptism, anyone? It seems that there's been an onslaught lately on Christian radio and even a funeral that I went to not too long ago. Baptism doesn't save anyone. Gibberish. This is how God works. No, baptism doesn't save anyone. God saves people through baptism. He uses his means, his word in all of its forms. Oh, the Lord's Supper, it's just bread and wine. We remember nonsense. Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood given for you for the forgiveness of sins. If the God who created all things with the word says something is so, it is so. And so it is. You are given his robe of righteousness. A robe washed in the blood of the Lamb. This is the most selfless act in all of history, all of his story. Jesus exchanged your sin for his righteousness. When the judgment of God comes looking for you, it only sees Christ because you're wearing his clothes. Back to the text. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Nothing in it for you except the love that God has given you for one another. (laughs) Nobility at its finest. The Lord Jesus Christ leads you in his paths of righteousness, a self-giving love that really there's nothing much in it for him. What do you have to offer Jesus that's of any value? Nobility. That's what we see in Christ. And he proclaims you to be noble. He proclaims you to be nobility. This is the way. Men, this is the way. We see Christ and his love for us, and we see what our love is to be for our wives. You're told not to be mama's boys here. But you belong to your wife, your wife belongs to you. Leave mama, leave daddy. You and the missus are one unit, undivided, bonded together, stronger than oak and fireproof. Now back to the ladies again. Ladies, if you had a man like this, Are you still going to be angry with him and say, I can't submit to such a monster? Are you going to wear pink hats and chant feminist chants that you can't be hippotassoed under such a brute? One who only desires your good? One who only wants to give you good things? One who's willing to lay down his life for you? Of course not. Of course you're not. Now I have good news and bad news for both of you, men and women. There's the rest of the passage. We read the mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Hey guys, good news. 
You're not really off the hook, but it's not about you after all. It's about Jesus. It's about how much he gives himself to his church, to you. He gives everything. He gives all that he is, all that he has, and he's God. He has everything, and he wants to give it freely to you. He gives his very lifeblood for you, to redeem you, to purchase you from the death of your sin. He does all of this. But wait, there's more. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Ladies, respect your man. Men, love your wife as Christ loves the church. Now, sorry ladies, the reality is we men, even we men of God, want to be like this perfect husband. We really do. We want to be like him. Truly we do. But we're sinners. We fall short of the glory of God every day, just like you do. And while many of us do indeed look like the Adonis on the cover of those romance novels, at least I do, I don't know about your husband, but, you know, Fabio, me. We aren't sinless yet. We're working on it. You heard us men this morning, and we heard you ladies this morning, confess that we're sinful and in need of a savior. We believe you, and you should believe us. But then we heard those words of grace, the words of mercy, the words of forgiveness, that Christ died for us, that he redeemed us, that he named us as his own. And we come humbly into our Father's house, and together, as one family, we receive that grace and mercy, confessing that we are nothing without it. Together we're forgiven. Together we are the bride of Christ. We are his precious. We are the one for whom he gave all. And we receive him and he transforms us ever so slowly into his likeness. Ladies, be merciful to us, guys. We're trying. Show a little respect and you might be surprised at how much we're willing to give but we will fail you. And then hopefully we'll come together and confess our sin together once again and receive God's grace once again as we come to his table, as we walk near the font and remember our baptisms, the place where God adopted us and claimed us as his own. And in the meantime, we contemplate and we find rest in the relentless mercy that our Savior has for sinners. And we give him thanks for his great mercies, which are new every morning. So rejoice, because you're forgiven. We can't measure up to this perfection, but we should shoot for it. And when we fail, which we will every day, we pray as Martin Luther does at the end of the day, forgive us, Lord, for we've sinned again. Send your holy angels to watch over me and my family. Protect us. Keep us safe. And may we rise to serve you with glad hearts in the morning. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace which passes all understanding keep and guard your hearts and minds to life everlasting through Jesus Christ our Lord.